The answer is no. Thanks for watching. Just kidding, of course, here is Professor Paula Dett, one of the preeminent lutenists of our time, talking about Bach's Lut Suite BWV 995. Guitarists know this as the third uh, Lut Suite. Um, it's, it's a fascinating piece in that it survives in several different sources. Uh, we have an autograph manuscript in Bach's hand, notated in keyboard notation in two staffs, one in soprano clef and one in bass clef, um, which says that it's a piece for the lute dedicated to a certain Monsieur Schuster, who turns out to be a Joseph Schuster, who was a, a lutenist in Leipzig at that time. Um, the fact that Bach notated this in keyboard notation is a clue that he did not play the lute sufficiently well enough to have notated the piece in lute tablature as, as lutenists would have done uh, at, the, at the time. And we also have a contemporary lute tablature version probably made by Adam Falkenhagen, who was an associate of Bach's, who studied in Leipzig. And the reason I believe that this tablature is in Falkenhagen's hand is that it is full of unusual ornament signs, and those ornament signs are identical to a table of ornaments in uh, Falkenhagen's hand. But that is just one piece. Let's hear now from Professor Elliot Fisk, who is a great Bach scholar and coincidentally also one of the last students of Andres Segovia, and he is going to talk to us about another traditional lute suite, this time the BWV 1006. Our particular work was also arranged by Bach later in life, probably from his Leipzig years, his later years, uh, in, a, in, a, in a version for probably a keyboard instrument which Bach owned and had in his house. Actually had two of them. When he passed away, they made a list of everything in the house. It was called specificatio. It's a Latin term saying that we are, we're now listing all the things in the house. They listed everything down to the candlestick holders. But amongst the things Bach had in the house were two instruments called Lautenberg, or Lautenwerke in the plural, which means a lute work, or basically it's a lute harpsichord. What was so interesting about this piece, it had a more restricted range, and it had gut strings, rather than the usual steel strings of the harpsichord, it had gut strings, and the gut strings were plucked with leather plectra, and therefore the sound of the Lautenwerk, or the lute harpsichord, was very similar to the lute. And it was said that it was so similar to the lute's sound that it could confuse, or, or not confuse, but could surprise a professional lutenist uh, with, the, with the sound that was so similar to the lute, although played on a keyboard. And that would make sense uh, in, in, a, in a work like this E major partita, which has gone into guitar tradition. People say, well, it's a lute suite. Well, the lute was tuned in D minor. And then lots and lots of other strings and courses of strings under that. So that meant if you played like a bar chord on the Baroque lute, you get a minor chord. And if you have open strings that are F, D, A, F, D, A, you don't have much help in playing a work in E major. So composing a work for the Baroque lute in the key of E major is something like composing a work for the classical guitar, maybe in, I don't know, something like uh, F minor or F major or maybe E flat major or minor. In other words, it's totally off this. It's, it's a key that doesn't have a lot of uh, natural resonance in the instrument. And I, th and I think for that reason, it's very unlikely that this piece was intended for the lute. Okay, so we got two pieces that are unlikely to have been written for the lute, but does this also apply to Bach's other compositions? The fact that when he died and they made the list of all the things in, in, in the house, there were these two Lautenwerke and there was also a lute in there. Now, people said Bach played the lute. I don't think Bach played the lute because, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the lute writing is not, is not particularly idiomatic. Any, anytime there, 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 it is there, it's not particularly idiomatic. But he would use the lute uh, in an atmospheric way in his big compositions. All right, but what about the famous lute fugue BWV 1000? We know that it's clearly the same piece as the BWV 1001 for violin, but since the lute one has the smaller number, that must have come first, right? 
Well, let's hear from Professor Nigel North, another one of the preeminent Lutenists of our time. I think the first thing that I'm aware of with this fugue is that there are actually three versions. The original, which we can trust, and I'm, I'm even going to hold it up here. This is a fact. So I wish this was the original. In Bach's own hand. And it's so beautifully written with so much detail. Bach had some friends in Leipzig uh, who were musicians, and one of them was a, an amateur lute player called Johann Christian Weirach, and he wrote out the fugue in tablature. We don't know if Bach heard it, and if he did, did he approve it, of it, or is it something that Weirach just did for his own uh, pleasure? Um, and about 150 years ago, when in Germany they were collecting all the works of Bach and making the first edition of Bach with all the BWV numbers, somebody decided certain pieces should be called lute pieces, and the fugue in G minor in Weirach's version became known as BWV 1000. Although the violin version comes from the sonata for violin in G minor, which is 1001. It's one of three manuscripts that we have in tablature of works by Bach, none of them written out by Bach. Um, there's no evidence that we have that Bach actually played the lute. Um, and of the G minor suite 995, he wrote it out in real notes uh, in his own hand. So I, I think he heard lute players, he knew what it sounded like, what the range was, but he didn't always know exactly how to space a chord. Okay, so that's also not a lute original, but we do know that Bach wrote lute parts for some of his orchestral music. Are those original? And in general, what instruments did Bach actually write music for? The Trauer Ode is uh, Cantata 198, it was a funeral piece that he wrote, and a very unique orchestration in that it had two lutes in it. It's the only piece that Bach wrote with two lute parts. And so this means that there's a lost passion that had you know, a big role for the lute. There's this one very uh, fascinating uh, account that the Bach family was visited for a month by two lutenists, namely by the great Silvius Leopoldus Weiss uh, and Kropfgans, who's another very important lutenist, lutenist, not as well known outside of lutenist circles today. But evidently Weiss and, and, and Kropfgans were in the Bach house for about a month, and there's this one tantalizing phrase that's come down to us through the centuries, something very special in the way of music happened during this encounter. And I always thought that the famous Prelude to an Allegro, and maybe even the, uh, the so-called second lute suite in C minor, the 997, B BWV 997, that those two pieces may have, uh, may have been created as a result of that vice visit. Certainly the Prelude to an Allegro is a good candidate because it's a very, you know, a very compact, very unusual form. Bach never used the Prelude to an Allegro form Ever, ever before or since that piece, as far as anybody knows. Right, so the Prelude Fugue in Allegro is also not an original lute work. And by the way, you can access detailed, deep lessons on every single one of these pieces mentioned so far on Tonebase. So if you'd like to check them out, click the link below to start a free two-week trial. Right, so does this mean that we're not supposed to play Bach on the lute or on the guitar? Well, let's hear once again from professors Paul Adet and Nigel North about Bach's place within the music scene of his time and also about whether we should treat his music as fixed and unmoving or rather as a living, breathing piece of art. As a researcher, I'm interested in what the historical sources say about performance practice uh, in this period. And I believe that Bach was really in the mainstream. He studied and performed the music of all of the major composers at the time. He um, corresponded with them. He played performances with a lot of the important composers of the time. So. I think people today often tr try to put Bach in a little vacuum sealed room and try to protect him from standard Baroque performance practices. And, and this is one of the sources of, um, I think, misunderstanding uh, that exists today. Now, when we play Bach on the guitar, I like to encourage guitarists, first of all, to think about the key. Historically, when Bach rearranged 
pieces from one instrument to another, he was free to change the key. So there are keyboard concertos that go up or down a tone from the original or vice versa. Um, the fifth cello suite changed from C minor to G minor, from the cello to the lute. And there's been some, well, lots of discussion in the last half century about um, affect and how each key would give a different emotional uh, feeling, uh, which is certainly true, but it didn't stop Bach changing a key. And so if you take a C minor cello suite, put it into G minor for the lute, it's going to sound different, it's going to feel different. My recommendation for all guitar players is play it in A minor because Bach himself chose keys that worked for the instrument, whatever he was writing for. As you can see, it turns out we have quite a lot of freedom to adapt Bach's music to the instrument we're playing, the key we're playing, and even the venue we're playing. I think one of the greatest disservices that we can do to Bach is to treat him like a museum piece, instead of an artist with burning passions and desires and the deep, deep sense of humanity. Let's hear one last time from Professor Elliot Fisk. I've always loved uh, reading the various Bach books produced by the marvelous Christoph Wolf, the famous first book, Johann Sebastian Bach, The Learned Musician, where he uh, traces the whole trajectory of Bach's life in the most wonderful way. And he quotes there a famous tribute to Bach that was written by one of his colleagues named Gessner, who was uh, his colleague in the, in the Thomas Schule. And uh, he, he describes Bach conducting, and, and it's, 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 it's a marvelous portrait, uh, one of the rare portraits that we really have of, of Bach and in terms of you know, wor verbal description. He says how Bach was singing with one voice and playing his own parts, watching over everything and bringing back to rhythm and, and the beat out of 30 or even 40 musicians, the one with a nod, another by tapping his foot, third with a warning finger, giving the right note to one from the top of his voice, to another from the bottom, and to a third from the middle of his voice, all alone in the midst of the greatest din made by all the participants. And although he is executing the most difficult parts himself, Noticing it once, whenever and wherever a mistake occurs, holding everyone together, taking precautions everywhere, and repairing any unsteadiness, full of rhythm in every part of his body. This one man taking in all these harmonies with his keen ear and emitting with his voice alone the tone of all the other voices. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a wonderfully uh, vibrant description of this guy. You know, we look at that kind of famous stern portrait of Bach that we all know so well. Um, but, you know, this, this, this idea of him having rhythm in every part of his body, you know, this probably, you know, is the result of, of course, being an organ player and his, they, they described how his feet would, you know, run over the, the keyboard that was down at the foot of the organist, right? And he was just, as, just, just about as versatile with his feet as other people were with their fingers. Okay, that about wraps it up. If you'd like to watch detailed video lessons on how to play any of the pieces mentioned in this video, including the Sweet BWV 995-1006, the Fugue, BWV 1000, the Prelude, Fugue, and Allegro, and thousands of other video lessons taught by hundreds of the world's most inspiring instructors, then head on over to Tonebase. And if you're not a member already, then start a free two-week trial by following the link in the description. All right, have a great one, everybody, and see you in the next one.